Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone to our second panel of our final day of our conference. Uh, this uh, panel is titled Medieval Digital Humanities 2. It's our second panel about this topic. And uh, we have three papers for this panel, uh, one by Francis Mikos. Uh, the second one is going to be by Matthew Davis and the final one by Christos Stravakos and Fanny Litari uh, once they, they join us. Uh, our chair is going to be, to be Professor Gunhan Borekci, who is a professor here at the Department of Medieval Studies at CEU. Uh, Gunhan uh, received his PhD degree in history from the Ohio State University in 2010. His main areas of research and teaching include early modern Ottoman political dynastic and social history, 17th century global crisis, military history, and historical network research. Uh, in, an, in addition to his numerous articles and encyclopedia entries on Ottoman history, he has published a, a series of works on primary sources with multiple scholars. So, uh, Gunhan, thank you very much for being here with us, and you can take it from there. Thank you, Juan. It's a pleasure. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good night, depending on where you're located for this uh, conference. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to join uh, from the beginning. I was on a travel, but here I am. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our uh, speakers for this panel, uh, which is uh, uh, entitled Medieval Digital Humanities uh, Part 2. Uh, so our first speaker uh, will be uh, uh, Francis Mikus. Uh, Francis is currently a doctoral candidate in history at uh, Université paris Anne. excuse my uh, rusted uh, uh, French, uh, uh, Partien Sorbonne. Uh, he did his master's in art history at Sorbonne's uh, Institut National du Soir de l'Art. Uh, his research has been centered on the imagery of Henry V of England, and he has written uh, several papers on uh, films, uh, Capra, Hitchcock, well as uh, Zemeckis, uh, as well as on Henry V, and uh, the relationship between history and images, which I also dearly uh, uh, find myself uh, in, in the field. Uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, he currently works at uh, Musée d'Orsay uh, in Paris, and today uh, he's going to present us his paper entitled The Invisible Image. Francis, this digital floor is now entirely yours. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me first? <laughs> the, the, yes. Good, good, good. Good. Yes. Yesterday there was a snafu with the sound, all it was a mess. Okay, let's see if I can share my screen. Voila, I want this one. Okay. Back to the front. Don't want to spoil all the, the images that you get to see. I do have some pretty pictures. <laughs> and let's see if the slideshow works this way. If I find it. <laughs> no, back up. Ah, oh, here it is. Simeon? Yes. Parfait. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to get lost in my own uh, in my own slideshow anyhow, so don't bear with me in that. Because in fact, the question, the show itself is about, excuse me, pictures. Why do we take pictures when you think of it? Ah, damn it. I get back to the beginning. If not, I'm not going to. I'll stay this way because if not, I'm going to get lost. <laughs> um, that way you can see. We take pictures basically to remember things. It's a simple way of putting it. Um, but the basic problem is that. What is it that we want to remember? And one of my profs pointed out that what we want to remember is what we risk forgetting. In other words, what had been dis destroyed so my four points that i was doing is basically destruction versus preservation what what is lost and what we're trying to preserve through the images the advantages of the of the images and the drawbacks of course and that's this is my basic outline for you to see so the first problem here is that um my prof is going barthelemy jomer was his name and he said that to every historical period architecturally but you can also think of it art artistically in any way Things get thrown away, get thrown, because they're old madams, and there's one destruction too many. Bam, everything goes crazy and things like that. And in England, it was, of course, the destruction of the monasteries. 
which happened in the span of about five years. And over those years, every almost everything medieval was just ripped out physically and turned into humps of stone. And that launched the great antiquarian movement in England. In France, that happened about 200 years later. And the architectural destruction that would really push things too far was Cluny, and that started the whole movement of the the war against the demolishers and all that sort of stuff. That doesn't say that the um, uh, that destruction doesn't continue, it just but it does abate, and we react to it differently, which is why I put Notre Dame right next to it because these things happen, and we try to save them. Now the reactions are really interesting. In France, we had. Mérimé, who was one of the major, Hugo wrote his book, Mérimé was the one who really did the interesting work. He, he, they invented and he started literally going around France, expecting monuments, saying, oh, this one's worth keeping, this one needs work and all that. Stuff. And he wrote, they're hilarious letters, I suggest you read them, because it really is a great read. Um, but he wrote um, a whole series of what should be inventoried and what should be saved about monuments and about things like that. The problem, of course, arises as well with manuscripts. It arises with works of art as well. What is worth keeping is a good question. But it begins the famed database in France, which is named the, the Bas Mérimée, actually. It's still there. Um, today, and the medievalists have become very good at this, at using modern technologies. I mean, Mérimée went around, but they're also the photographers of the time. And today, we have on an explosion of possibilities of availability of access and the medievalists are at the top, the front end of all this um and we were just, we just had two talks earlier this morning exactly about that again and all that um in creating ways to access images and which i find fascinating because they do really you the medievalists have a call for papers but they also have a manuscript blog just on facebook they also have specific medieval England pages, things that you don't have for film scholars. <laughs> there isn't a call for favorite film for film scholars, which is really weird when you think of it, because, and I don't even think there's a, I don't know it as well, but there, if gamers and gamer scholars have a call for paper page. So I think the medievalists are really very, very much on the top of that. And there are obvious advantages to that. The first one being access. Um, and that, let me come back to my notes, is much of what is recorded becomes available, becomes is otherwise would otherwise have been invisible, which is why manuscripts are such an interesting um, example. But we have all sorts of things. Remember, this is this hasn't started yesterday. The printed page and the arrival of photos allowed for books. We have access. This is my own picture of going once you can go to a. Uh, an exhibition you can go you can take your picture you keep it you have online pictures and just the museums themselves have been creating websites so it really is an interesting proliferation that can be used that can be taken there when it comes to manuscripts you have a real problem because manuscripts being very fragile are not often seen now you have the case i have here of the book of kells which has an entire museum room explaining it creating the it also shows the book of kells in a veritable shrine as you can see and you can go see that at the other end of the spectrum is the très riche de duc de berry which is actually quite spe spectacularly invisible it had been acquired by the the chateau de uh, musée de chantilly in the late 19th century and since then has never been seen. And yet it is probably the most famous of book of manuscripts in the manuscript world. Uh, it was made famous by the 1904 Primitif Francais um, exhibit, but even in that exhibit, it was invisible. It was shown as black and white photos, except for one, I think was a color, but Fundamentally, the first color reproductions are these, which are actually lovely in their own right. The the, the lithography based by the on the, by Ver magazine in the late 30s and early 40s. That is, by the way, the basis upon which 
and the only possible basis upon which Laurence Olivier could have made his film, by the way. He had no access to the original manuscript. He saw those pictures and he said, that's how I'm going to make my film, which is also interesting. Um, the problem with reproductions, of course, is quality. We'll get back to that a little later. Um, you may have a black and white postcard. You may have Life magazines, which has its problems with grain, as a matter of fact. Um, or you may have the scans that are used for Wikipedia or others, which are pretty good. But at all times, we never know what that quality is. So we're coming back now. That brings us to the beginnings of our drawbacks. Um, I think the first major drawback is you can't really study the object. You can study its content, but as McLuhan put it, the medium is the message. And the one medium, the content of one medium is another medium. So what we're studying is actually another medium. In other words, we are studying the photos of objects. And now that creates a major problem. I gave this example. These are two manuscripts. One on my left is the Great Bible. This thing is about a half a meter high, 60 centimeters high by 40 centimeters wide. Right next to it is the Très Petites Heures d'Anne de Bretagne, which is literally 10 times smaller. It is six centimeters high by four centimeters wide. Which one is the bigger one if you're looking at it on the screen? And so, which has the bigger pictures and things like that. But if you were to look at this in the reality, that little picture in the, in the Great Bible is probably about the size of my page. I don't know because I've never seen it. Um, that is, I think, the first. The other problem is one that I'm coming to a different problem, is literally placement. This is um, actually a mural painting at Saint-Sulpice in Paris at De La Croix. It's a beautiful mural painting and things like that. But usually when you look at it like this, you see it essentially as a landscape. So that is the, the dominant part of the picture. But if you go to Saint-Sulpice, you're not gonna see it at all like that. You're gonna see it more like this. In other words, because you're actually gonna see it from below, the light's coming from the side, and the major view is this. And so suddenly the subject, by the, the fight between Jacob and the angel makes sense. And the background literally is thrown in the background just by the angle of the way we're looking at it. So the reality of the image is not necessarily the reality of the photo. This brings on a third problem just by giving the example is the quality of pictures. You have one where this pulls very much the orange, the other one where the orange disappears. And each image is going to be different. So when you're studying the photo of a photo, you have to be very careful of what you're looking at and what the color balances are. And there are some, I've seen the, the photographers at the Musée d'Orsay, I work there, and they literally will have color bars and things like that. But even that is not necessarily true to the painting or the work of art or the manuscript. Um, Daniel Arras once noted that we, when we go to museums, see paintings in conditions that the artist could never have even imagined of lighting, of distance, of just basically surrounding space. But in fact, these works are pulled out of context. And that gets even worse when we're dealing with the images of images. Finally, the materials themselves can be problematic. Gold, as it had been noted, is sometimes very difficult to follow. This is from the regiment printed. This whole background here is actually gold leaf, but the gold leaf may pull to the red. There are other pictures I've seen where it'll sometimes pull to the green and the, the gold itself comes out as kind of a basically a saffron yellow. It's no longer gold anymore. It's just a picture of gold. And so again, we could study the content of the image and there are really interesting papers on the Arundel on the, on this picture and things like that. But, we have difficulties being able to study the image itself just quite simply because we don't have access to it. Um, thus, it should always be remembered that we're never really when studying pictures of works, we are studying in fact, 
reasonably acceptable facsimiles. And that is, I think, uh, a major question that always has to be read to. Um, and that is, I think, the one thing that leaves me problematic because how many layers are we dealing with? Sometimes we have just directly the photos. But if I come back to this picture here, this is a scan taken from the photos, from a photo. So how many levels have I gone through and how much have I lost? Maybe not much, maybe enormously, but I don't know. And that's really, that also becomes a major problem. Now, the interesting thing about this is as scholars, we're expected to ignore these intermediary levels. We're expected to discuss the Arundel manuscript or Delacroix's painting as if we were discussing the manuscript and the painting and if it were in front of us right now, but they aren't. And in the case of this, this uh, of this forum, we even have a, a third remove because you're looking at me through a screen, showing you a screen, and it gets it gets really hairy after a while. <laughs> um, and so, at best, what can we actually study? Well, we can study the content, which is fine if you're a paleographer when you think of it, because all you really do need is a picture of the page to actually decipher the damn thing. But even there, I'd be willing to bet that there are times where you really do have to go to the original manuscript to check what you're looking at, things like that. Um, images demand the scrutiny of sometimes looking at the depth of the painting. If you're dealing with Van Gogh, you're not gonna have the same experience as if you're dealing with Ingres or you're dealing with Delacroix because just how they painted needs to be seen at times. So fortunately though, and this is something I find important, um, scholarship on the whole is a conversation with scholars. In other words, what really is interesting isn't so much that I'm saying things, is that I'm listening to you say things and I build on that and you will know what I'll say. And I can take on faith that, um, this is what peer review does after all, what other scholars say about the materiality of the work is valid information and useful and I can work on for that. Um, and so it does help to build and it does help me bring new other things, but it does limit what I can do, in fact. Now, all this is fine and dandy until the very day you'll ask me to publish something and then you have a big problem that suddenly these images of images become very real and it's sometimes very expensive and they have their own reality is true. It's fair in some ways. Um, the photographers who took the pictures in the first place spent a lot of time working on it. Even scanning can be a seriously delicate problem as uh, the, the just the previous post, uh, Metamismatei's shows that you can, the scan will pick up things that shouldn't be scanned or scan things wrong. So you do have to be careful of what's doing. There is work involved and it's fair that you pay for the work, but I mean, Again, you come with the problem that you have a screen that literally jumps in front of you, <laughs> which is the cash screen, if I may put it in those things. But there are other signs of that way as well. And these, by the way, these uh, fees can reach astronomic proportions, I think. Um, though I think it creates, again, a final problem of a third layer of, of I'm going to make a print of the replays. And so we're still there. So that reminds us that as a time, we do have to remember that we're working with what we're working at. And what I think holds true for scholars holds even more true for the general public. Um, and this is something I've noticed a lot working in museums, actually, I've worked, is how actually little people were look at the works of art when they come to see. They pay. They pay sometimes good money. I mean, the um, uh, the Musée d'Orsay is no longer cheap. I mean, it's about sixteen euros to walk into, and when they come, they don't stop. They don't look at the works. They don't study them. Uh, what they usually do is they take a picture, and in the case of the the, the Mona Lisa, as we see, it becomes 
impossible. It becomes impossible for anybody else to look at the works because everybody is taking a selfie, taking a picture. And we have learned not to look at objects, be they artistic, but to look at their representations. And I would think as a teacher, um, it would help to te remind our students to actually look at the fact that we are negotiating filters and how to negotiate them and how to accept them, how a given edition of a book may change the intent of the book itself, sometimes very subtly, sometimes very well, but it does change things. And we have to understand that. And as the distance that separates us from our object of study greatens, it becomes more and more necessary to learn how to close the gap. And the, I think closing the gap is learning how to stop looking at images and images and seeing and to see sometimes accepting the distances um, are unfathomable. We can't necessarily see all the churches in the world, even though it'd be, it's great to have a catalog to know them, but the ones we really want to see are the ones that are going to be next door. Learn to put away the telephone or our phone and look at the works. Because I think it becomes necessary to realize that these images of images keep us at arm's length. We can explore the content, we can explore the, what is being shown, what is being said, but we can no longer look at things. And if we can no longer look at them, we can no longer experience them. And I think that is the heart of the problem. Ah, my last page. Voila. Thank you. This is by my my personal collection. <laughs> so it's only, it's a direct scan from an original. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francis, for this uh, critical, actually, uh, remarks, a uh, set of critical remarks regarding the images uh, and images of images that we uh, use and utilize. And indeed, uh, I will have a question for you. Uh, but now our uh, turn uh, is for our second presenter today, uh, Professor uh, Matthew Davis. Uh, uh, Matthew uh, received his PhD in English literature with a certificate in digital humanities from Texas uh, A&M uh, in 2013. Uh, he currently uh, serves as the uh, ZKS Landrum Assistant Professor at Durham uh, University. Uh, he has been a, a fellow uh, in different universities uh, previously, and he additionally served as a consultant on several digital projects uh, in the GLAM sphere, and, in, in, and, and he was the editor of two volumes uh, dealing with the digital tools and methods for the study of medieval and early modern culture. Uh, they are titled Medieval, Meeting the Medieval in a Digital World uh, with Eje Turnatur. Uh, she was my actually former friend and colleague from Boaz University, I know. And Tamini, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Tamsin uh, Mahoney Steele. And the other volume is entitled uh, New Technologies and Renaissance Studies, uh, Volume 3 uh, with Colin Wilder. Um, uh, Professor Davies has a, a, a quite a, a large spectrum of uh, interests in research. Uh, but his works, uh, works uh, deal uh, mostly with the histories of the book, staging practices of medieval drama, cultural transmission uh, uh, through what he calls informational uh, palimpsests and the question of digital representation of the material object, uh, just like just Francis uh, mentioned. Um, today, um, he will present us uh, his paper uh, called Made in Wies of Ballet, using the digital to complicate the lines between codex and performance in the works of John Lidgate. Matthew, uh, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen on this. Um, there we go. Okay. The okay, can, can you all see that? Just a sec. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, excellent. I'm experiencing some stuttering, so if after this, if I drop or anything, let me during the, during the questions, and I'll be happy to explain anything that you might miss. Um, so I want to start this talk by making some assumptions that I hope you all keep in mind throughout. 
first. Um, what we popularly consider uh, content is just another way of talking about text. That's the way we think about it. Secondly, that our popular conception of content treats the text as a platonic ideal. But the underlying assumption is what Francis was, was talking about too, that it can fluidly kind of fit into any container we want with nothing lost. And finally, that we treat the means we use to find texts as akin to the means we use to contextualize texts by treating somewhat arbitrary categories as bedrock truths. And I wanna to suggest today that those are all really kind of profound misconceptions. In reality, any action taken to inscribe text, the initial act of creation, the interpretive work we do in the classroom or in scholarship every day, or presentation via book, manuscript, or online display, is an act of interpretation at best and intervention at worst. The tools we use to write, the ways we read the articles we use for our research, uh, the methods by which we express the ideas formed from that research, and increasingly the metadata standards we attempt to incorporate all text within under the banner of interoperability has certain expectations and goals in mind. And increasingly those expectations and goals are built around metadata ontologies designed to allow text to be found quickly by individuals and read by machines, which in turn means that contextualizing texts is more and more about placing them within already existing categories, rather than recognizing the text without preconceived notions and shaping those categories to match. Now we know uh, this phenomenon is going on and there are a lot of people who are working to counter it. But one thing we aren't doing as we're encouraged by our institutions and funding agencies to build digital tool after digital tool is to state frankly that the development of those tools and the methods used to do so are in and of themselves theories with staked opinions about how things should be done. And the application of these methodological approaches, especially in fields such as medieval studies, where it's more and more likely that finances will mean that a version of the material instantiation, the primary source of our study, manuscripts, inscriptions, artworks, things like that, are encountered first online, have very real consequences for the understanding of the material object that is being displayed in a virtual facsimile. In other words, the choices we make now, which are imposed upon us by programming infrastructures or institutional fiat, have very real consequences that may become baked into our thinking. This isn't necessarily a new thing. The Early English Text Society refers to several poems by the 15th century poet John Lydgate as being occasional poems, despite some of the manuscripts in which they are contained. Uh, British Library Additional 29729, Cambridge Trinity R320, and Bileen Ashmole 59, referring to them as mummings or disguisings made in Wiesabala, and thus implying they are in fact performances written by in a poetic format rather than simply poems in and of themselves. This century old editorial decision puts them firmly in a tradition of Lydgate as poet and poet only that places his work within the realm of the codex and the additions and models built to serve that codex rather than acknowledging the extracodical lives of many of his works. Limiting the scope of the poet's over in that way has several unintended modes of thinking attached to it that we can see in how we approach not only medieval, but modern texts as well. First and foremost of these is the idea that we can actually take human expression and divide it up into chunks, and then arrange those chunks in ways that still have the same meaning and which map to the applications needed to serve them. This matters because the way we divide up how we think about uh, things actively encourages that certain elements, like for example, the paratext attached to a particular text, or the context surrounding its production and use, as in the case of these performances, are placed into black boxes and simply not thought about anymore because they supposedly have no real impact on how we're working with these tools. The addition worries about the text as text, not about the text as holistic. Since they don't affect the presentation of content, the implication is they simply do not matter, which can have very unintended consequences when scaling a project beyond a single scholar, as most digital projects are. I have a friend who I met while they were working on a large scale, multi person, grant funded project to digitize, transcribe, annotate, and describe medieval manuscript texts. Since it's a large scale grant funded project, most of the actual work of programming has been given over to experts in that discipline, while the scholars have concentrated primarily on the transcription and annotation sides of things. 
The head of this conceptual team spent years working with these manuscripts, but only in the form of image files. And those image files when presented on the screen were always the same size as Francis was talking about. Just, um, now to those of us who come to digital scholarship through book history, and particularly through code ecology, there's an implicit understanding that obviously books are different sizes. A book of hours, for example, would be small, so as to fit in the pocket or purse of a busy person as they go about their day. And the Koyetz Gigas, the largest medieval manuscript in the world, is a presentation text, nearly a meter tall, intended to be read to an audience. As such, nobody gave much thought to actually mentioning size while discussing the project. And when this programmer finally got to interact with some of the real physical manuscript books he'd been working with, the first thing he expressed was surprised that they weren't the same size. He had been operating on the assumption that there was a uniformity to medieval text that simply wasn't there. The image files, even though they had the color bars and rulers that are standard for digitization that Francis talked about, still gave the impression that the material objects depicted in them had a uniformity of appearance and thus of use that was not there. The materiality of the object, the paratext and context, was abstracted into an afterthought and placed inside a black box. Because the programmer I mentioned here, who's brilliant by the way, experienced these manuscripts in one particular narrowly focused way, that set of implicit assumptions became part of his modes of thought regarding how to present and display them online. And as more and more students and researchers experience medieval material cultures through online media, it is paramount that we combat or counteract these sorts of applied assumptions. How an idea is encoded and expressed to the world in speech or writing is thus every bit as important as the idea itself. And that has to be an active part of our thinking when we consider it. Uh, so Sir implied as much as of course in general linguistics. There he basically says that any sign is composed of two parts. Um, gone one too far, there we go. The actual physical object or the concept being considered and the term used to represent that object or concept. Sir goes on to note that the relationship changes based on the particular language being used, but to generalize even further, and I'm taking this from a, another semantician, Charles Sanders Peirce, there's actually a third category wherein the relationship between the object and the terms describing it is affected by how we understand and express that relationship. Peirce called this idea the interpretant, and it's there with the interpretant that we have the ability to start to articulate some of why the context that we experience as digital and material objects we work with matter, why, they, why it's important. Because that understanding is not the actual text, the actual performance, but the basis for a future description of that text, the process of receiving, incorporating, and expressing ideas becomes a sort of telephone game, where one missed or added bit of information threatens to shift how we think about that object far into the future. The fact that Lydgate's mummings and disguising appear in the early English Text Society edition as occasional poems means that the idea of them as primarily as poems, as text on the page, rather than as a piece performed before an audience, became part of how we articulate and think about them as informational constructs. Regardless of how he intended it, the valence is attached to the word occasional, the Henry Noble McCracken attached to the poem, means that it became part of our understanding in ways we don't intend, or didn't intend rather. The interpretant mediates our understanding of things for good or for ill. Because the interpretant mediates that understanding, content is not just a platonic ideal composed of atomized concepts floating in the ether to be organized through ontological categorization. Instead, content is always mediated by the ways that we receive it, whether on a screen, a printed page, or in performance, and thus is a part of a network that extends out into the world through those tools and ideas. That conceptual footprint means that none of us are divorced from the world around us, and we're all part of a network of overlapping materials and ideas receiving, processing, and encoding ideas. A single link in a giant chain, or just one of many people playing the world's biggest version of that telephone game. This can be seen in this two-page opening of the Queen Mary Psalter. So far, it looks pretty standard, right? This is how the British Library presents the two pages when you look at it in a web browser. To make it look like we'd expect, like an opening, what I had to do is capture each page as a separate image file and merge those files so they could be placed next to each other. This takes my computer, uh, a web browser, and a piece of graphics software. 
Notice that I've said each of these things. I've taken what is, was a lot of work and turned it into a single idea expressed by a single term. And I haven't talked about the camera equipment, servers, or skilled workers that took to digitize and store, store the success of pages in the first place, or the political network that resulted in the acquisition of the manuscript, its eventual deposit in the British Library, the economic network to provide the money to make that purchase possible, or the network of scrubble production, manuscript acquisition, and bindery that went into the development of the original Psalter. All of that very real, very material work is functionally invisible and is largely eliminated both by the way the British Library presents the book online and by the way that I took the two images and manipulated them so as to appear as a single opening. But it goes beyond this. If you go to the British Library catalog description for this particular opening, it will say correctly that the picture on the left and the bottom of the image of this particular opening is a nole mitangere, when Christ tells Mary Magdalene she is not to touch his resurrected form. What it doesn't note is that this is actually part of a four item sequence that depicts the post crucifixion life of Mary Magdalene at, as medieval people understood it. That life isn't what is remembered today because we tend to refer back to the Bible more than the plethora of extra biblical material that people in the Middle Ages also used to inform their faith. And because of how it is presented, both in regards to the pictures and in the catalog description, that story is largely lost. In other words, the character, the cataloger infirmed the character of Mary Magdalene from context, but did not complete the story. When researchers fail to consider the theoretical apparatus behind their tools as part of the larger process of their scholarship, they are in effect doing the same work I did in placing the two images from the Psalter together without the additional context provided in explaining the process to you. They are reducing the entire apparatus involved in putting a virtual facsimile of the text online into a single block with a single author or editor who, in turn, is dedicated to a single action, the conveyance of decontextualized content to the waiting user. Moreover, in doing so without commentary as to the processes involved or the decisions made that, um, made that adaptation is being presented as more than functionally similar to the original, is being presented as though it is the original, but only the way it's presented changed. Obviously, if we stop and think about it for a moment, this is utterly impossible. But when we approach the material objects we work with and their large scale and mediating networks, it's something we do every day. And as the anecdote of my friend's team member shows, making those assumptions about material artifacts can result in errors in judgment. In the case of the programmer, the error was relatively mild. But in the case of the British Library cataloger, it has real implications for how we are able to understand the material object that their digital platform presents. I can catch that error because I have the necessary specialist knowledge to do so. But as our use of digital technologies and the use of humanities scholarship grows, especially with the rise of algorithmic reading-based methodologies, such an error could have grave consequences that go unnoticed because the actual objects of study have extracted beyond our ability to check them for accuracy. And the metadata used to underpin those readings literally cannot see the problem because it's beyond the scope it was built for. The framework that digital scholarship with text operates in within my discipline uh, is known as the Text Encoding Initiative. It is an XML uh, namespace that largely assumes that the reason for its being is to create editions of texts or to break them down into semantic chunks that can be easily be read by machines for natural language processing. As such, there's a tendency to privilege the text of the object that strongly mirrors our cultural tendency to conflate text and content. Much like how we assume that content can fit into any container we wish, text is sectioned off from its material presentation and that material presentation, when noted, relegated to a separate section. But it's also possible, and they've done it with an alternate version of their framework, to structure that text in a way that mirrors the actual ways that it appears on the page. This is a newer development, however, and inertia has meant that the original text model uh, has tended to be followed even in cases where the alternative might make better sense. So this works if you assume that content and the means of presenting that content are truly agnostic and can, and can be held separate. However, it also assumes that technology of presentation exists independent of the content driven by that technology. Instead, we have to remain aware of the ways the things we work with are mediated and the assumptions that mediation encourages, rather than treating them as black boxes. Right now, when such a mediating box collapses, it's often by happenstance, as in the case of my discovery in the, in the British Library catalog and the, uh, the Mary Magdalene images. It's possible, however, to engage in conscience 
or careful and reasoned collapse through a constant questioning of the network and the pieces that comprise it. Such question networks and the transparency they generate will allow us both to acknowledge that our work with digital and material tools is itself the result of our status as interpretant of the signs encapsulated in the material object of our study, and to make the networks surrounding our interpretation and preparation of those networks for display online readily apparent to our eventual audience. Such work requires thinking through presentation in a way that both follows and moves beyond the limitation of facsimile-based models, as I hope to demonstrate here. The uh, minor works of John Lickett archive and the work I'm currently engaged in regarding his mummies in the skies into Durham comes out of finding unique versions of two of his poems, the Testament and the Quistabe Capiti Meo Phantom Lacrimarum at the parish church of the Holy Trinity in Long Melford, Suffolk. What makes these poems unique, however, is they are not the versions found they have been altered specifically to fit the purpose and space provided for them in the Clopton Chantry Chapel. And pardon me for a second, I have to switch windows here because will not, um, Unfortunately, uh, PowerPoint doesn't have a way to handle this. So this is a, um, oh, this is not, I'll tell you what, I will post the link to this or I'll provide a link to this because this is not showing up the way it should. Um, so it makes it not for just found in academic student editions. Instead, they've been altered specifically to fit the purpose and space provided for them in the Clopton Chantry Chapel and are painted on carved wooden panels within that chapel space. And unfortunately, that takes a lot of computational overhead to build that model. And I think Zoom is eating a lot of it. So it may or may not come up, but it can't be read standing still as you might with the poems as they exist in the book. Instead, you have to interact with the space, moving around, turning it, and looking at each panel in turn. They're unique cultural items with their own unique place in the world. But they aren't treated as viable items of study in their own right because the apparatus we use to interact with literature, the printed edition, has no real place for such city aristocratic works and their associated paratexts. Nor does the British Library's viewer or other tools like it um, handle this because they. Uh, make assumptions based on the manuscript book rather on the object as it actually exists. This means that the unique nature of these poems and the network of understanding surrounding them are in danger of being subsumed under a single standard edition version. My original intention then was to try to open up this black box and make scholars and students aware of not only of these alternate versions of these two poems, but of the ways in which manuscript and print versions of the text are presented. It snowballed a bit from there to a comparative analysis of all the versions of the two poems, and from there to attempt to transcribe all of the works by Lickett that might have had a performative life in all of their witnesses. Uh, the model itself is built using a process called stereophotogrammetry. I took about 500 pictures of the chapel in a fairly regular pattern basically by taking a picture of my tripod at the lowest setting, adjusting to the highest setting, taking another picture, and then moving one foot to the right and repeating the process. And I used a piece of software called Agisoft Metashape to stitch the pictures together into a three-dimensional model. The model itself works because the software picked up on the differences between uh, points on all the photographs and uses them to develop a three-dimensional view. Someone on the site can then manipulate the model to get a sense of how the various verses of the poem are laid out around the room and click on individual verses to get to the more traditional transcription and facing image that might have been how they would have been captured under a traditional edition. The model is presented on the site in a way that deliberately highlights the fact that it's incomplete and thus forces the viewer to remember the role of the computer in their experience of the chapel. In turn, this hopefully forces recognition of the network underlying the development of the text for display online and makes viewers consider the physicality of the space in a way that might not otherwise occur. More importantly, this way the model makes people aware of the poems in a way that hopefully encourages them to go to Long Melford and see them in person, which will hopefully help to keep them preserved in the long term. 
Besides the JavaScript used for the comparison feature of the model, tailored JavaScript is also used to display the relationships between aspects of the text as they exist today and hopefully make them aware of holes that they might exist in current scholarship. Furthermore, this sort of force directed model allows a viewer to, at a glance, see what texts exist alongside each other in the manuscript witness, where those texts are located. Currently, and who is involved in their production and distribution. This is all possible because of the underlying metadata frameworks these texts exist within, but those frameworks are immediately laid bare to the viewer in a way they are not within the traditional edition, and thus are not allowed to be reduced to a single object in the case, as they are in the case of Queen Mary Salter. Admittedly, both the model and the force directed graph are crude approximations of the physical space at Long Melford and the relational network associated with, with existing ligate poems, respectively. However, they serve their purpose to remind readers of the physicality of these material objects and the fact that they do not exist as simple images on a website or Google image search. Instead, they have a real and ongoing life that the digital version can only approximate. Since all edition facsimiles are ultimately adaptations of a changing immutable set of ideas, a virtual adaptation of a unique cultural object should attempt to accurately model a material original but explicitly acknowledge it is not itself an adequate substitution for that material original. Rather than claim that it is, we as scholars should firmly and transparently articulate the stakes of our project and the ways in which it approaches the text in its presentation online. This work is largely already done when it comes to transcription methods and display of content in books, as TEI demonstrates, but it falls woefully behind when it comes to context and paratext. In articulating the decisions made in choosing or developing a platform, and the methods used in presentation of content, a reader is at least made aware of those things that are hidden in the online presentation of that content, and thus a space is provided for them to interact with them as well. So today I've attempted to articulate what I see as the problem of presentation in medieval material objects online, and how I approach that problem in my own digital scholarship. It's not intended as a comprehensive discussion of the theoretical or methodological decisions I've made in the development of my own digital projects, nor could I hope to do so in the time provided. I do hope, however, that the brief explanation of the aim of the minor works of John Lydgate's site and my current work at Durham help to spark some ideas for your own work. Moreover, I hope they illustrate the point I was making at the beginning of this talk, the clear, careful, and transparent articulation of the technical as well as theoretical approaches to a project. It helped illuminate the resulting virtual product in a way that allows it to be both understood and used by a wide audience. Most importantly, that good digital work should maintain a continual awareness, repeatedly articulated, of the network of influence surrounding the tools and ideas used, even when those tools and ideas are not necessarily based in your particular expertise. Such articulations are particularly important when you are the only person working on a project, because making yourself open to your audience in every aspect of development allows them to see why decisions were made and how what you've done both speaks to and pushes back against the reduction of the things you care about to mere content. In my case, that's medieval manuscripts or cultural heritage. But I hope there are aspects of what I've said today that speak to you, no matter what your interests are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Indeed, it does speak to uh, many of us, I'm sure. Uh, I am already very much inspired and, and warned by your remarks. Thank you. This was brilliant. This was really, really excellent. I, I look forward to uh, following your work more. Now, um, <clears throat> I see on the screen uh, Fanny. Uh, who else we have? Uh, Good morning, and... only me, unfortunately. Okay, <laughs> okay. then, then, uh, then I will, I will then. Uh, so Christos and and Christophoros is not here. Uh, are, are no, not no. Here with us. Okay. So uh, our last uh, speaker, uh, last paper will be um, Fanny uh, Litari. Uh, uh, she received her PhD in Byzantine and post Byzantine archaeology. Uh, from the University of uh, uh, Ionina on the subject, uh, the fresco decoration of the Church of the Dormition of the Virgin uh, in uh, Kalambaka uh, from uh, 1573. Uh, and I see that her thesis is in the uh, process of being published. Uh, congratulations yes. for that. Thank uh, you very thanks much. to the sponsorship of the Metropolitan Academy of Theological and Historical Studies of uh, Kalambaka. And uh, 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 Dr. Litari is an experienced archaeologist with a demonstrated history of working in the Byzantine and mostly post-Byzantine arts and uh, crafts industry. <clears throat> 
and, uh, and she's uh, currently an archaeologist uh, at the uh, Euphorate of Antiquities uh, in Ioannina. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a joint paper, I assume. Uh, is, that this, is that so? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. then the, the joint paper uh, she will present us uh, is entitled Bessarion, mm -hmm. a modern portable Byzantine intellectual for the donor inscriptions from the Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments of Epirus. Yes. So the floor is yours. Thank, uh, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone from Greece. So uh, I will start by sharing my screen. Uh, Okay, you see everything well? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, what is Bezerion? Bezerion is a research project with an interdisciplinary object and collaboration from the University of Ioannina of the Departments of History, Archaeology and Informatics, Computer Engineering with the Ephorate of Antiquities of Arta. Founded under the operational program Open Innovation in Culture 2014-2020, was approved in December 2019 and continues successfully. The project team consists of the University of Ioannina, the research teams of professors Christophorus Niku, who is the principal investigator of the project, and Christos Stavrakos from the Department of History and Archaeology, who is responsible for the epigraphic material. This project is a continuation of the project History Supporting Research and Economic Development in Underdeveloped Regions, Donor, Dedicatory Inscriptions and Donor Portraits in the Christian Monuments of Epirus, 4th to 18th century founded by the Excellence II of the European Union and the General Secretary of Research of the Hellenic Republic. Now, our project. Our project has the acronym Bezerion. Bezerion was an intellectual of the 15th century in Byzantium. Bezerion introduced Christianized readings of Plato's dialogues characterizing him as the pagan philosopher best suited to Roman theology. Bezerion's argumentative strategy not only rescued Plato, but also opened the path to an, an anti-metaphysical approach to Aristotelianism, while revealing to the Latin world a wealth of knowledge from his Greek cultural heritage. The main issue of the proposal is the invention, implementation and completion of a software that, that uh, performs automatic analysis, transcription and translation of Byzantine and post-Byzantine inscriptions for portable software devices. The application is intended for use by both non-experts, typically tourists, during a similar archaeological site and by experts. The goal is the user, after locating the camera of the mobile phone, smartphone, iPhone, Android, etc., targets that interest him and have the ability to relevant information in the following ways. A, analysis of the inscription. The caption is automatically identified based on the image signal that we receive from the mobile phone camera with captions from a suitable rich database, which we create during the project. Because there are no identical inscriptions, the more related inscription to the caption in terms of stylistic, stylistics, estimated period and content, are given to the user as parallel. Other information, such as the possible historical value of the inscription of the history of persons, mentioned, for example, benefactor, donors, or other officials mentioned in the inscription, is provided to the guarded user if desired. 
in addition, the image of the caption can be sent over the internet to a server that will be connected to the database to be added to the database hardware if necessary. B, automatic transcription of the inscription. Based on automatic image processing algorithms in which the IT research team has significant experience, the inscription is transcribed on the user's mobile phone. This aspect of it can greatly help the user's touring experience especially when dealing with illegible signs or signs with many abbreviations. C, automatic translation of the inscription. If the language of the inscription is such that the user finds it difficult to understand the content of the inscription, he is provided with the automatic translation into modern Greek or possibly later in other languages. The translation is done through the identification from the database, or if the inscription is not there, through an automatic translation estimation algorithm. The automatic translation estimator includes project specific and relies on in-depth computational techniques for learning and processing natural language. Technology related to the proposed are the automatic tour systems or commonly audio guides. The audio guide systems give information to the visitor with an oral description of the important places of the monument he is visiting. As an evolution of this simple audio guide, there are systems that work through a mobile computing device such as the systems suggested by some of the most visited museums, such as the Louvre Museum and the British Museum. The aim is to make, on the one hand, to the general public, A, the content, and B, the history of the Byzantine and post-Byzantine monuments of Epirus through the information resulting from the fountain inscription. But on the other side, this research project wants, wants to start dealing with a desideratum of the Byzantine inscription, such as the classification of the types of letters of the wall inscriptions. The object of the project is the creation of letter recognition software, which will categorize by century and will enable further readings and matches. Of course, necessary for the function of the application is the collection and entry to the database of many elements and informations relating to the inscription by the archaeologist, uh, archaeologist team. So I would like to demonstrate you how we work. Uh, all the information is entered in an environment, in a program, uh, that was created by the IT team, which is called Alithia, from the Greek word true. We choose a start new, new, new document from here. And uh, from our archive uh, with the inscription that we collect during the previous project, which I have mentioned, we choose the, the following inscription. And as you can see here on the inscription, with the tools zoom in and zoom out, we can better see uh, more, de more details from the inscription. So the next step is to mark the area of the inscription where the letters are found by using the proper tool. Next step is to note every line of the text. And here you can see the result when all the lines are marked. Next step is to highlight each word of the whole text. And in the next slide, you can see the final uh, result when all the words uh, are marked. So uh, we continue by highlighting each letter of the inscription 
and here when all the letters are ready. The final and most important for us step is the selection of letters and their transcription into modern Greek. And also we follow the same procedure for the words. As you can see here, uh, here Athanasiou, Athanasios, and here is the transcription of the modern Greek. Final, it is important to mention that this whole process that you have seen is done in every photo of every inscription, but also in different photographic captures of the same inscription. So he, you can imagine the size of, of, of our work. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Fanny. This is also uh, something uh, that I, I believe it, it will, will change the way people also uh, I hope so. <laughs> we see hope so. and learn these things. It's, it's really amazing. Um, so uh, thank you once again for all three presenters and of course uh, those missing colleagues here. Um, now, um, I'm informed that I can actually enjoy being the panel chair to ask the first question. Uh, of course, I have several, but I, I think uh, here is what I can perhaps ask for all three uh, 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 here uh, with one single question, and I'm, I'm also curious what you think about that. I mean, uh, of course, uh, Francis, uh, Matthew, and now Fanny uh, told us about how we digitally process, see, utilize uh, physical uh, objects like images, inscriptions. Uh, and I, I think uh, Matthew uh, brilliantly laid out uh, the, the general problem or a set of general problems. So I was thinking, what do you think about, for instance, the virtual reality uh, that is also uh, developing uh, enormously? Uh, I'm sure you, you, you know about, uh, of course, needless to say, metaverse is now everywhere, right? So I was thinking, you know, how would you, you know, um, take on this uh, developing technology, which is becoming really much more precise uh, in many ways, like, you know, about the perspective of things, you know, the human, you know, uh, uh, size and the material object around us. Uh, for instance, um, Francis, what would you think that, you know, the problems you mentioned us about, for instance, a manuscript, uh, or Matthew also mentioned about the size of a manuscript, you know, small and big. How about, for instance, you know, uh, we, we have a virtual reality device, let's say, just a simple glass. Uh, through digital technologies, you know, we can actually feel, digitally speaking, uh, the size of that object uh, as it is, you know. Uh, and also, how would you, for instance, um, solve uh, the problem of, you know, these institutions like libraries, museums, uh, they just, you know, catalog and present their physical collections to us, um, and, and indeed, we are having much less access now. I mean, I am, I am the generation of historians who had worked in the archives, manuscript collections, but now uh, my students are pretty much uh, doing everything on digitally uh, without actually seeing these objects. So how would you, for instance, suggest what, do, what we do as scholars um, and, and work with, with these institutions? Uh, one thing I have in mind is we should definitely establish new training uh, programs uh, for cultural heritage people, museum people, librarians, uh, you know, all sorts of others to work with us in this larger, you know, world of digital, uh, digital transformation. So uh, I hope I was clear on what I wanted to uh, ask three of you. And one uh, very specific question to uh, Fanny, do you use crowdsourcing for this collection of inscriptions? Uh, so uh, thank you again. Maybe you can you can just answer this question and then uh, I allow Francis Matthew in return. Let me answer first because it's a quick answer, but it's an interesting question actually, as, as because in fact um, the amount of information adds and helps to refine that information. Um, for instance, the example she gave us had a little word missing. Um, and you would you would think it would have to be by comparing with other images of uh, other texts that you could guess what that word would be, which
which has always been something that has fascinated me when I was uh, looking at paleographers and things like that, when they find themselves with a text that is just riddled with holes, that they can actually figure out what the whole text is. But it's because they know by comparison. So I think that. Uh, I would like uh, to um, to ask uh, because I don't understand what do you mean uh, with the Kraus? Kraus sourcing. What is this? Uh, I mean, you 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 have your uh, you know uh, application on the let's say mobile phones, right? And let's say you know one tourist or one uh, uh, traveler goes onto a mountain and then just finds this you know piece of inscription on a you know structure uh, that has not been in your database and takes a photo sends you uh, do you have a program for um, uh, like advertising and and kind of encouraging people to you know take more photos of the inscriptions they see not just in uh, certain areas in Epirus but also largely you know in let's say in Greece uh, yes I understand now uh, the, uh, so this software can collect all the information that uh, when a tourist take a photo so we can take all the information uh, even there is no uh, the inscription in our database we, we take this information from the tourist and so uh, after um, because we have uh, select all the elements from the letters the words the software can recognize uh, the inscription from the tourist so uh, with that uh, way, our database um, uh, gets more information, and uh, it's uh, it's it's more rich for information. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This was what yeah. I was uh, wondering. Yes, Matthew. So I, I thought, Danny, I thought your, your guys' tool was brilliant. I don't imagine I could, it would ever work with anything I work with because we can't even spell properly with middle, like consistently with middle English, much less have hands that are machine readable, but that, that's an awesome tool. Um, speaking to the, the question of VR, so I'm, I'm, I'm two minds on it. Um, on the one hand, I think it could be an incredibly useful tool, especially when dealing with with architectural spaces or dealing with large scale artwork, uh, dealing with, with size and manuscripts, things like that. Um, things like haptic feedback would be really, really nice in terms of, of preserving the weight of these things. You know, having, um, I was at the Walters when I was a grad student and one of the kind of formative experiences for me was they were showing us a, a uh, Shakespeare first folio. And I just said, can I take a look at that? And they just handed it to me like it was, you know, a book in, in chapters or waterstones or borders or wherever. And that meant a lot to me because I had never been, you know, it, it, this used to be sacrosanct things, but they were just handing to me like it was, you know, an everyday item. Um, the issues I see with it are that 3D objects are generally, um, what, what we would call lossy mm -hmm. in that they're the, the texture, the texture basically they built out of wireframe, like chicken, like a chicken wire framework kind of thing, but digitally. And then the texture might be might considered the equivalent of the paper mache put over the top. Mm -hmm. And then the, the problem is, is that the image that generates that texture is, is quite often compressed. It has to be in order to, to, you know, go online. And I was actually going to have to be even more compressed to be in a, uh, you know, a VR helmet or something because you'd be operating with with phone and such. I'd be concerned that um, things could get lost mm -hmm. if it, if there, if it's not done carefully. The solution to that, I think, is what I was talking about. You know, make you know constantly sort of poking at the viewer and saying, "No, this isn't the thing. You're actually you aren't actually seeing the thing." You're not, you're not actually seeing the light in Plato's cave. You're seeing the shadow on the wall, you know, and, and just constantly reinforce that for them so that what they, so they're getting the experience of the object. They're getting the sense of what it is, but they also realize they're not getting the full sense of what it is. Um, I think that's, that needs to be something, if we're talking about retraining, we need to stress because quite often what happens now is it's, it's all about 
finding things quickly and getting them out there for people. Mm -hmm. And any contextualization that happens, happens over the top of finding things quickly and getting them out to people. It's sort of an afterthought. And I think it needs to be more of, of part of the whole package. Thank you. Yes, I, I totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, the problems of uh, 3D, the virtual realities, of course, I mean, there, I was just wondering, you know, uh, what could be done uh, with the available technology, which is truly, I mean, uh, mind blowing when I, when I, you know, try to, to follow up these new projects, uh, you know, uh, that I, I see the quality uh, and even now they're, they're working on actual neuronic, you know, like connection with your brain, uh, you know, that you can actually feel things. I mean, so yes, indeed. I think, I think this is the new age, right? We will, we will see how, how it develops, but I see, I see the hand. Thank you so much, Matthew. I see the hand of uh, Juan, uh, Manuel, uh, go ahead, Juan. Yeah, I, I just have a, a comment uh, or maybe I would like to know your opinion on this, uh, on what you were mentioning about 3D and what Matthew was mentioning about 3D. Because of course, when you talk about this, this this form of technology, the first thing that in my case comes to mind, of course, is video games because I grew up playing video games and I play a lot of video games. And something that catches, caught my attention in all of this, for example, what Matthew was saying between the differences in the sizes of an illustration, right? When we have a PDF, we, it's just a PDF. We don't think about the size of it in which this virtual reality can be very helpful in recontextualizing these type of objects, right? Like you could potentially, I mean, depending on the technology, see this difference. But of course, that's what makes me think is like the amount, I mean, the quality of the technology to actually be able to replicate that very right. experience. Because in the end, it's not even, it's not even the size. Uh, it brought uh, to my head, uh, there is this case, uh, one of the chronicles of the first crusade, right? You can, it, it was in a monastery. And you can maybe recreate the size and put it in the monastery and you're saying something. But the thing is that when you have the volume complete, this story of the first crusade is in the middle of other two stories that contextualize it more fully. So even if you wanted to replicate all of that in a 3D space or call it as a video game, again, like in my head is the amount of work and technology behind it is just which again is very easy. We are very easily fooled by the perceived materiality of these digital spaces that we're right. so used to. That was more. Well, it's like, opinion. yeah, it's like, um, I mean, I know that I, I couldn't attend yesterday, but at the panel, I know there's a panel on Kingdom Come Deliverance. Um, the amount of research that went into replicating medieval Bohemia for that game was extensive, but it's, it's, you can still tell it's a game. You know, the, the, the textures and the, the ob, you know, the objects in the space and such. There's, it's not it it it's, it, there's an, a certain level of uncanny valley to it. Um, what I think I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing though. Um, because one of the things that, well, I'll talk about you know one of the things I think, I, I one of the things that worries me is that like you were talking about with with the archives that the notion that we have virtual versions of these things so we don't have to worry about the physical object anymore. You know, the physical object can be safely sort of locked up, set aside, isolated. That's how we lost, that's yeah. how we lost many manuscripts because once we right. started transcribing them to print, they didn't need the manuscripts, so they threw them away. Right. Um, of course, all this would good them through, it's kind of the dream of the Star Trek holodeck in a way. <laughs> and um, which has always raised interesting questions because uh, one of the texts I came across was uh, Pastoureau's reminiscence about um, his being a technical advisor for a film. And he was saying, well, look at all the details that we just don't know. When did a monk put his cap on or take it off? How um, all, take the four screens we have that are open right now, the five right here, and look behind you. What are all the details that you see? What are the C details that you don't see? How do you see them? What are the? It is all that in the, 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 the infinite number of infinite infinitesimal small, or sometimes enormous pieces of information that we just don't have and we never will have, and that we cannot necessarily recreate, which is a problem. I think. Well, I mean, it, it's it's an interesting um, uh, it's an interesting concept, but it's what the French use as a term as an SM thought. It is something that we will always point to, like reaching infinity, but we'll never get there. Always, there's always be a, a disjunct between what is real and what is not real, which is an important disjunct to maintain. 
and to remember that we, that's what going to a museum is all about. We go see the original works. We go see um, Van Gogh's paintings. And because Van Gogh's paintings change over time, the Van Gogh that you may have seen if you were fortunate enough or old enough to have gone to see him in 1980 is not going to look like what he looks like today. I've been working 23 years and it's still, and they're changing. No, no, no. That creates the interesting problem of institutions and working with institutions because that generates another problem of what I call, of how I define culture. And culture for me, at least, has always been a network of shared references. In other words, I can discuss Van Gogh or Manet or things like that. I'm working there and I've also worked at the Louvre. And so I, you start connecting dots. And if my collection of dots are not your collection of dots, um, uh, and this is by this as much uh, in social levels, but also just in basic uh, societal levels. Like for instance, what I know of or what I take for granted and what Fanny takes for granted are completely different. And I'm I'm also I'm I'm also a stranger because I I'm living in Paris and my mother is French so I have a whole another set of dots to play with. Um, now, how do we make that so that some a kid's dots who has his own set of dots, which are interesting and which we should be able to play with, um, become part of our dots, if I may put it that in those terms? And how do that can they become part of the picture? A good example of this is the Beatles. For instance, in 1962, the Beatles were high school, were children's music, basically. It was uh, 14, 16 year olds who were listening to it. And then suddenly it, it accrued into the general culture. Now it's part of the planetary culture. But how that, that is the process. And that is how I think as scholars, as teachers, and as people, or as a museum guards, we can make the, the works come alive for people. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, I, and I think that's what we're, we we try to do. That's what I try to do. Is, um, uh, um, even at my basic level, I'm I'm actually ground zero. I work in the rooms. If you want to come see me uh, next week at the Musée de Louvre, I'll be there. I don't work on May Day, but that's. <laughs> but I, I'm there, and I can tell you about things, and I I can tell you what I know, and I know the curators know a lot more. But that's not, that's that's part of it. What I, what I find as as interesting is. What do you feel about it? What do you see about it? How does that make a meaning? And how does that bring? Because that's where I pick up interesting information for the next person. Ah, I heard that saying that. For instance, one person pointed out how Manet does not show the end of a table and therefore is playing with. I had never noticed that, just as I'd never noticed the little frog at the bottom of the digit. And that's how things come alive. It's because, ah, there's somebody else that's known. It's, and we, we expand on those shared references and we create those shared references. And that is, I think, the great problem. Hence, the holodeck is, I think, is a hollow dream, in fact. And it's not a necessarily useful one. I think what is a more useful one is to value what the facsimiles can bring to us, making them known that we can actually understand them. Or uh, paleography, um, the, just looking, I can, I've studied Greek, so I've, see the modern Greek, because I'm used to modern texts and things like that, but it's fun to see the old texts and see how the, the, the shape of letters have changed and how we, and that all explored. These are all things that can be explored in the long term, um, and I'm going to stop because I'm beginning to ramble. I can hear it myself. Thank myself. you. Thank you. But um, I, that, think, I think that's the basic point. I think so that uh, the beauty of our program is that one that the persons, the tourists, needs to be uh, in the environment and uh, we, try, we try to enrich uh, his knowledge with all this information from the inscription. And um, uh, it's all this interactive with the other tourists, uh, the other persons in the monument. So it's something different from, uh, from something uh, uh, for the virtual reality. Something real, I think so, as yeah. concerning our project. So you might think of it in, in a, as an augmented reality project as opposed to a virtual reality project. Mm -hmm. it's, it's adding to the real world as opposed to creating a facsimile of it. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, um, I, 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 as a chair, I, I just noticed that uh, Doversky uh, put in the chat box that uh, there is actually virtual reality materials at Wessex. Uh, 
So thank you so much for that note. Uh, and of course, uh, now in, in every museum, uh, this way or that way, there's something digital, right? The old, good old, you know, uh, windows, uh, uh, information boards, they are all changing. So in that sense, indeed, I agree with Francis that this is, this is you know, a long-term uh, thing. But let me also mention one thing, if I may, if there's no other question, more on our, on our side of like editing texts, as, as Matthew, you mentioned. Um, for instance, uh, uh, for, for generations, including even myself, I will say, uh, that we thought about that coming up, you know, with a good standard critical edition of a work which had so many like, you know, manuscript copies. Uh, indeed, now this is a problem because we basically intervene, you know, uh, and, and create this just one single modern book, not the historical work over there. And in the previous session, uh, you know, the, the Dante's, uh, you know, uh, uh, works were like similar, right? There's so many copies and there's a print edition of print editions, but still it becomes much less, you know, diverse. But we also know that manuscripts, specifically manuscripts, uh, each copy is unique. Uh, it has its own date, writing style, patron, sponsor, all that, you know. So, so now with digital technologies, we are able to actually create for each, you know, copy uh, something. And in, if you're interested, for instance, uh, there is a 16th century Ottoman poet, uh, the poet of the century, uh, Baki, and University of Washington. Uh, had been dealing with this, uh, you know, putting every single copy, manuscript copy available so that we can, for instance, trace how this great poet, he's a comparator of Shakespeare, actually changed his own lines, you know? Uh, and, and that tells a lot about, you know, his emotions of the time, maybe his, you know, search for a new patron, you know? So, so instead of one single modern edition, now we have multiple editions, almost all editions. So, so I think this is another aspect we should keep in mind when we are working with digital uh, editions. Uh, we should not uh, stuck with that old, in, in a way, modern notion of, oh, let's come up with one single critical mm -hmm. edition. I think that's, right. that's also something to consider. Thank you. Well, that, that's the, the way that I approach. I, I'm, I'm approaching the, the site is, is not as um, creating, a, creating a digital edition. And there's, I've worked on projects that, are, that, that that's really their goal, um, is ra but rather to create sort of an, a, an adjunct to the existing early text society editions. I, I, I'm not 100% fond of his, his goal was to create a Lydgate canon. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really talk very much about the, the manuscript as manuscripts. Um, but because that's the, the, the text everyone uses when they're doing scholarly work, I want to make these other witnesses and quite often it's just very slight changes between them, but there, there are slight changes based on either scribal intent or, um, variations in dialect and Middle English, things like that, that can and can change the meaning of the poem. And in um, the, two play, the two poems of Long Melford, they purposely excised verses from the poem to change the meaning to fit that architectural space. And that doesn't happen in any of the manuscript witnesses. So that's part of the reason why that's what I led with because that's, they've, they've literally changed what the poems mean, but there's no, place to see that change meaning other than going physically to this you know this location mm -hmm. in East Anglia and that's kind of a problem oh, no I think I think what you did is amazing I mean all, all that uh, you know photography you did I mean how, how long did it take for you to finish that um well the, the taking Robert. the pictures <laughs> the, the pictures was about a day um building the model took three days rendering on, I, at the time I happened to own two laptops, but rendering on, so I was rendering on both laptops in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, while I'm over here, part of my goal is to go back and fill in some of the, I, I mentioned in the talk that I intentionally left it, it incomplete and that's true, but there are things that are incomplete that I didn't intend to be incomplete. And so to kind of go back in and fill those in again and rebuild the model based on that. The floor is what I, I intend not to be complete because it's, it's not particularly interesting and it, it kind of forces a viewer to recognize that it's, it's not the physical space. But the underside of some elements, I didn't get enough images to, for the program to be able to build it completely. So I need to go back in and kind of fill in the gaps mm -hmm. before I have and to. You, 
and you yeah. use natural light when you take photos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I just went there and took um, pictures during the day. I, I, I make no claims that is I I tried to when I took the pictures of the actual um, the actual panel individual panels. If you go to that model and click on the individual panels, it will take you to the panel in a facing transcription and more traditional kind of facsimile style um, look. For those, I, I did make an attempt to use a color card and try to, to correct them and everything. When building the model, I was more interested in just capturing the way that these panels interacted with, with each other in the physical space, rather than worrying about being perfectly, you know, perfect. Because there, there are models out there where there's these apparatuses people use where there's like 16 cameras on a circular apparatus and they, they, they take 16 pictures at once. I was, I'm one person with a, a consumer grade, well, nice consumer grade camera and I'm taking the pictures one at a time. So there's well, limits to what I could do. That's still amazing. Thank you for sharing us with these details. Uh, any other uh, last minute questions we have? I think uh, four or five minutes left, uh, right one? Uh, yeah, we have four minutes left, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so just to stick with the time, uh, anyone uh, for the remarks, uh, examples? Uh, I mean, one, one thing I'm, I'm personally fascinated by how creative also we become when we are challenged by these new problems. Uh, you never think of these issues before. And now, of course, uh, uh, the, the teamwork is equally important. I think these research projects like European Union, like, you know, ERC projects and all other, you know, institutions support. I, I think, you know, in, in less than a decade, I think we will be really uh, living in a totally different world of knowledge, uh, if not, you know, sooner. Um, okay, there's one note in the chat box. Uh, oh, that's just a, a thank you uh, from Mariana. Anyone uh, last minute? I mean, if there are no more remarks, maybe we can close the panel. Yeah, we can there. close the panel and you you take it from here. One, yeah, one second. So, uh, I thank uh, you all. Again, thank you for uh, Francis, Matthew and Fanny. Uh, there were really, really interesting papers, the ones that you have just delivered to all of us. Uh, also, thank you, Gunhan, for, for chairing the session. And now we will have a longer lunch break and our next panel is at Two, which is going to be the last uh, panel session before our closing keynote lecture, uh, which is entitled The Pedagogy of Digital Middle Ages. Uh, again, we want to remember everyone that we have been uploading our uh, sessions to our YouTube channel. So of course, if you have any restrictions that you would like on the dissemination of your paper, please let us know. And we'll see you all at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Also, also, one last thing. Uh, we'll have a get together uh, at uh, seven o'clock, according to Central European time on Topia. It's just an informal get together. If you wish to join, you're very welcome, both paper givers and uh, the attendees. Thank you very much.